Hi, I'm Kelly Humphreys here at the NASA Johnson Space Center in the Immunology Lab with Brian Crucian. Brian's a NASA immunologist and he's looking at astronauts in space. Can you tell us what the issues are with space flight and the immune system? It's a good question. Uh, the human immune system is altered during space flight. Uh, we're unsure of exactly what the nature of that change is though. People have been looking at the immune system in, regarding space flight for decades, but the vast majority of those have been post-flight studies. And collecting samples and looking at this in astronauts after flight doesn't necessarily tell you the status of the immune system during flight. Um, Re-entry is a, a tremendous physio physiological stress on the body, readaptation to gravity. So we've been, the community has been waiting for a research platform such as the space station that affords us the opportunity to examine this type of physiological question during space flight. So, do you know what causes this change in the immune system yet? That's another good question. Uh, there are multiple factors that can influence the immune system during space flight. Uh, radiation, the most sensitive cells to radiation in the body are the immune precursors in the bone marrow. Uh, also, microgravity itself may affect uh, how immune cells activate and perform their functions. Uh, but also, physiological stress, confinement, isolation, disrupted circadian rhythms all have the potential to influence the immune system. So we, we generally consider it being a problem of how is the immune system during space flight and, and not necessarily re, uh, in response to any of those specific variables. Okay. Well, what kind of equipment do we have on board the space station that the astronauts use to uh, get the samples you need? Well, for our study, uh, we collect blood uh, samples from the astronauts during space flight and we return them to the ground for analysis. Uh, much as you might go to your doctor's office and, and give a sample that's collected in your doctor's office and it's sent to the reference lab. We're the reference lab for the space station for this study. Um, what's unique about our blood collections is uh, most blood collections on orbit are frozen for uh, um, uh, frozen return to Earth and analysis. Uh, because we need live immune cells to gauge their functional capacity, uh, we need to collect our samples uh, during docked operations of some vehicle and then right before hatch closure and undocking of that vehicle so they can return our samples. So if it's Soyuz uh, or the shuttle, when we had the shuttle, uh, we would collect our samples just before hatch closure. They would bring the samples to us. Um, we collect them in special types of tubes that maintain their viability for 48 to 72 hours and that gets us a nice live sample that we can analyze in the laboratory here at JSC. Can you tell us what you use to collect blood samples on orbit? Sure. We, uh, we have a blood sample collection kit that was designed for this study. Uh, I have a training unit here I can show you. Uh, a lot of Velcro. Velcro is a very handy thing to have on orbit for, for deploying your, your kit and uh, keeping all the items uh, readily available in front of you. Uh, it has most of the components you might expect. Uh, uh, needles, gloves, uh, tourniquet, band-aids. Uh, also, we especially collect our blood samples in these padded tubes to protect them for, uh, for landing, re-entry. Uh, we collect our samples in two types of tubes, uh, both anticoagulated to prevent the blood from clotting, uh, a purple top tube and a yellow uh, tube which actually contains nutrients uh, to keep the cells alive for 48 to 72 hours so we can get those live cells uh, back to the laboratory for analysis. Those look a lot like the tubes that they put my blood into when I go to the doctor. Is it harder to take blood in microgravity than it is on the Earth? Actually, we didn't know that starting the study, but it turns out that it is. Um, when you collect samples, blood samples on the ground, if you picture how this might work in your doctor's office, they fill the tube and the tube fills uh, from the bottom to the top. We, we cheat when we have gravity available to us. In space, you lose that uh, ability to gauge when the tube is full. and kind of fills the tube all at once and, and foams into the tube. So what was happening in the early part of the study is we were getting samples that were not quite filled all the way until we learned what was happening. We had some nice on-orbit video uh, collected by the crew members sent to us that helped us uh, determine what was going on. And now we simply time the collections uh, to make sure we have a, uh, a completely full sample. So you mentioned that uh, there are changes in the immune system that might not be a big problem on the space station close to home, but would be a big problem if you're on your way to Mars or something on a long duration flight. Why is that? You, you characterized it perfectly. Basically, we see immune changes during space flight. Uh, we see it maintaining itself for six months during low Earth orbital flight, but that doesn't necessarily mean crew members are sick. It means we're seeing transient immune changes, and we all experience those uh, periodically on the ground. Uh, but we, during a uh, uh, flight on the space station, uh, we don't really see that progress uh, to, a, to a very high level to clinical disease. 
Uh, so it's an interesting phenomenon. Uh, what we're concerned about is how the environment will change during an exploration class mission. If you're in a, a smaller vehicle for three years at a time on your way to Mars or an asteroid, the situation is dramatically changed. You, the radiation environment is elevated. Uh, you have more limited clinical care. Uh, you don't have a return option anymore. So these things that were minor problems, uh, potentially minor medical problems on the space station, could become much more serious in that environment. And specific adverse clinical events uh, could include things like hypersensitivities, uh, allergic responses, infectious disease, um, and that type of thing. So Brian, you do a lot of analysis in the lab of that blood that you bring down from the space station. Can you show us a little bit about that here on your computer and, and what you're looking at here in these, in, in these uh, readings? Sure. Basically, this is a flow cytometer. Uh, it has a laser. We shine that on the cells as we pass them in front of the laser beam. It scatters the light. We can also stain the cells with various dyes that allows us to separate them out into populations and identify them. Uh, we do two types of assays. Assays that look at the distribution of the immune cells in the blood. Uh, that's very similar to if you went to the physician and he drew a tube and ordered a complete blood count or a CBC. Uh, that looks at, at a very high level, uh, certain bulk populations. Uh, by staining them with various dyes, we're, we're able to resolve uh, many more different subsets of subsets of immune cells. Uh, so when we look at the distribution of those in your body right now, it tells us a little bit about any pathology you may be experiencing today. Uh, second aspect of, of the analysis is to take those cells and culture them in the laboratory, uh, pulse them with various chemicals to stimulate them and simulate an immune response in a test tube. Then we can look at their functional capacity. So on one hand, we're looking at the distribution and their numbers. On the other hand, we're looking at their functional capacity or whether they're working well or not. Um, so what are all these little dots and boxes here? Well, these are typical flow cytometry scatter plots. And basically, we'll, we'll stain the cells in a test tube, load it onto the machine, uh, pass it through the machine, and we can plot any of these parameters against each other. Each dot is a cell, so we'll collect 10,000 cells or, or, or so, and we'll resolve various populations, and then that's how we're able to count them. Uh, so here we've resolved T cells, and then we can take the T cells and separate them into CD4, CD positive subsets. Then we can take the CD8 positive subsets, further separate that out, into naive cells, active cytotoxic cells, or, or aged immune cells. And that's how we uh, use this uh, instrument to look at the distribution of the cells in the blood. So, Brian Crucian, thank you very much for having us here in the NASA Immunology Lab. Uh, we really appreciate you showing us around. It's a pleasure having you. Stop by anytime. Great. Thanks a whole lot. And with that, we'll send you back to Mission Control. Thank you.